will be voting for districts one, three, and five council members as well as for mayor. I'm Marna Shillman. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters and the moderator for the mayoral part of tonight's program. That will begin shortly. The League of Women Voters has provided nonpartisan political information since 1920. We're particularly focused on voter education and voter information. Our websites are lwv larimercountyorg and vote411.org. I'd like to thank the League's voter service team for organizing the forum tonight and the City of Fort Collins, which is filming the forum for rebroadcast on Channel 14 multiple times before the election. The April 2nd election will be conducted by mail. Ballots will be mailed tomorrow, Friday, March 15th. Ballots are being sent to active voters and to those who voted in one of the two last general elections. If you have not received a mail ballot by March 25th, you may call the city clerk's office. That number is 970-211, excuse me, 221-6515. 221-6515. And that office can help you determine whether you're eligible to vote in this election. The city asks that you mail your ballots back by Friday, March 29th. You must return your ballots by election day 7 p.m. to the city clerk's office. And each ballot must be signed by the voter or it won't be counted. For city information about this election, especially for information about what district you're in, you can go to fcgov.com slash vote. Tonight's mayoral forum will be 30 minutes long. After that, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll follow with the district candidates forum. We're very, very pleased tonight to have both candidates for mayor participating. They are seated in alphabetical order by last name, starting on the left as you face them. So Eric Sutherland is on the left, and Karen Wykenot is on your right. The forum ground rules are these. Each candidate will have two minutes to make an opening statement. After that, questions will be asked, and candidates have a minute and a half to answer. Most of these questions are provided by you, in fact, the audience, and they're screened to avoid duplication. Timekeepers are seated in the front row and will display one minute and 30 minute signals and also when time has expired. For the audience, we ask you to please turn off your phones and please refrain from expressing opinions by gesturing, by laughing, by booing, or by comment. We'll begin questioning on the left with Eric and switch every time a question is answered. However, when it's time to wrap up, we'll begin on the right with Karen. So let's begin. Eric, will you please introduce yourself and explain why you're running for mayor? Uh, thanks, Marta. I'm Eric Sutherland. 22 Could you turn on your mic, please? Thanks, Anne. I'm Eric Sutherland, 22-year resident of Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, about six years ago, I started coming down here to City Hall on Tuesday nights. There was an issue that was very perplexing for me. Um, the ratepayers of Fort Collins were putting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars really into something called renewable energy credits through our electric bills. Nobody could really explain to me what this was doing, what we were accomplishing with this expenditure. There were certainly experts in the field of energy they were telling me that this is a, not a productive investment for the community to make. And at the same time, I knew we need to be making investments in our future. We need to be making investments in our children's energy future. And this isn't the way to do it. And it took me about two years, but eventually I was able to reverse that policy. And in so doing, I saved my fellow ratepayers about a million dollars so far and counting. Now, that's not 
the only problem I've encountered down here at City Hall. In fact, I continue to encounter more. Over the years, I've been started going to the Platte River Power Authority Board of Directors and meetings. That's our wholesale electric supplier. I've been doing that for three years. Started going to the county commissioner's weekly business meetings, and that's been going on for about two years. And in the whole process, I've developed a pretty thorough understanding of the, lo of the mechanics of local government. I think I have a lot to bring to the city in terms of developing solutions for the future. I know we're facing significant problems as the community grows. And there's just an awful lot of things that I'd like to bring to this community and can only do that as mayor. As a citizen, I've been able to stop quite a few mistakes, not all of them. I wish I could have stopped more smart meters, for example. But actually getting a vote up here on council and getting some opportunity to provide leadership I believe would be a significant benefit for this community and I greatly appreciate your support. Thanks. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to first thank the League for the opportunity to be here this evening and have the community present as you've done for so many years. I can't believe it, over 90. That's amazing. And, and I'd like to thank you, the residents of Force Collins, for coming out this evening and giving up your Thursday night to find out more about what's going on in the community. Thank you for caring. Serving as your mayor the past two years has been a tremendous honor. As most of you know, I'm Karen Wykenot, and I am the current mayor of Fort Collins. Previously, I served on city council for eight years, planning and zoning for four years, and I've spent over 37 years in the community working to better the business community and being in business. And besides the last two years serving as mayor, together we have worked to face the important issues that are here in the community, whether it's been transportation or housing, fire or drought, decreasing revenue or job losses. We've been there, worked it together. But for me as mayor, my proudest moments have been when I've had that opportunity to represent you out in the community. It's you, our engaged and caring citizens, that make Fort Collins great. I am truly proud to serve you, and I want to continue doing that. Thank you for the opportunities to be here tonight, and I, I look forward to the discussion that we'll have with the issues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Karen, here is the first question. What is the most important role of the mayor as leader of the city? Should the mayor be an independent leader or a team player? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. The, Mayor is a representative of all the people in the community and must be a team player. It's coming in and, and leadership is as much a process as it is taking the lead role. You know, it's coming forward, identifying what are the important issues to the community and the challenges that are there, and then making sure that there's adequate information from the entire community, the stakeholders and the council, and working together to create positive solutions that can come. Uh, as a leader, it is extremely important to be collaborative and to work with all parties from all different backgrounds with all different information. So definitely it's working as a team player to build a consensus and a direction. Thank you. Now, the team is the people. The team is the community. The team are the people that you see walking in the supermarket. Some of them you know are having a little bit of time putting the food on the table. The team are the people taking risks with their money, capital, working on developing new businesses. That's the team you work with as, as mayor. It's the entire community. You're their single point of focus for every single business, every single resident in the community into what happens with our community government, how we steward public resources. And so that's the team you're working with. Our whole council city manager form of government is predicated on the idea that we will have seven strong individuals up here. 
seven strong influences over what happens in the government. And, but the teamwork always goes between those seven people and the community that they represent. That's what it's at. Say so one of the strongest or one of the most important parts of being a mayor is working with other public agencies. The city government is not the only public agency delivering service here, and that regional collaboration is a piece that we can greatly improve upon. We do not need to be defunding our partners in county government, Foothills, Gateway, et cetera, to pursue economic development goals as we, as we are right now. And that regional collaboration piece has to be put forward because they're part of the team as well. That's the teamwork that we're gonna pursue when I'm mayor, thanks. Thanks. Eric, here's a CSU question. Fort Collins residents are critically impacted by CSU's decisions regarding football stadium, the number of students to accept the types of facilities. How can the city do a better job in working cooperatively with CSU to ensure that residents' concern are heard by CSU officials? That's a great question. Thanks for that. You know, I'm going to go back a couple of years to where, through a long legislative process, a consensus opinion was delivered on the U plus two ordinance, something that was a specific concern to a lot of people who live in neighborhoods in and around CSU and really the entire community, including the student population. After the aftermath of that, I started lobbying immediately for a planned programmed approach to putting student housing in our community in a way that not only just matches beds to heads, but also creates the verve and the excitement that students, that draw students to Fort Collins and make sure that they're having a lot of fun and especially learning a lot when they're living here. That's something that I don't believe the city has done a very good job of doing and something we could do much better in the future. We are sort of taking what the industry gives us in that area and a planned programmed approach would have been much better. I understand that there's a lot of people here in the audience, people listening, that are very concerned about CSU's decisions to build a stadium, as am I. I've been a participant in the group that has been organized to put a different counterpoint to that need of the stadium forward. I think that that's something that the community needs to continue the discussion on. City government's role in that decision is going to be quite limited. The best we might be able to do is support CSU if indeed they make the decision to move the stadium here but I think that the entire impact needs to be measured by the city. There was a uh, movement recently before the council to kind of use our initiative, and I'm at stop right there, but thank you very so, much. Thank you, thank you for watching the time. Thank Karen? you. Colorado State University is a tremendous asset to the community of Fort Collins, and it's a wonderful partner. We have throughout the years continuously worked with the university on issues that are relevant to the community. It stands to reason that there, if you have over 25,000 students, they are impacting what happens in our community and we both need places at the table. But we have worked together collaboratively and in great partnerships. We deal with issues constantly. Talk about our, our transit system and transportation. We're at the table with both of them. The uh, transit system couldn't work without the benefit of the university working with us. We have um, worked collaboratively with university connections, university connections, in building a vision for the community. They are a tremendous economic impact and Currently, the city does have a liaison group that meets with the university. We've worked with the Associated Students Association, and when we came to SHAP, the Student Housing Action Plan, working to have that communication between. That's how we build community together and mitigate some of the impacts that go with it. Very positive relationships with the university as well they should be as we build together a community. Thank you. Here's an economic growth question. How does population growth affect the local job market? What role should city government play? Karen? Okay. You know, the economy is critical in what happens within the community and um, 
our economic health is the basis for what creates community. We need to have businesses and jobs to help keep our residents here and to fund the services that we as a community value. Population is changing and, and I think to address it as numbers does a disservice because it's the demographics that actually affect the population change. As we're looking at the community recently, we're seeing the numbers shift. It's not so much young families moving in and increasing population in that respect. We have a major shift to senior demographics. We have single family residents, which will change the housing market, it changes the job market, the recent um, direction towards uh, telecommunity. These all change how you build communities. So population by numbers is a miss um, piece of information, I think, when we're discussing the, the job growth, the economic growth. It's based on other factors when we look into the demographics of who and what that population is and how we're changing. Thank you. Eric? Uh, this is always going to be a subject of conversation in politics. First thing I want to focus on, first thing I'd like to share with you is I don't want to lose the soul of this community as we move forward. I moved here 22 years ago, could not believe my astounding good luck. Loved every single day I've lived in Fort Collins for a variety of reasons. The simplicity with which we can move around our community, natural beauty of Larimer County, Northern Colorado, etc. Don't want to lose pieces of that as we grow. And I think that takes an enormous amount of forethought, planning, and programming. I think we lost a huge piece of our soul recently when the city government was involved with twice threatening an existing business, a long-standing business in Fort Collins, with force taking through eminent domain. Threats, not, act, not followed with action repeatedly. That is not how I would see our city government pursuing economic gains, economic benefits in the future. I'm very disappointed with that. But further, I just say that, you know, there are, is a way of putting public resources to work intelligently to grease the skids for desirable economic activity. I've been a longtime proponent of doing that. There are smart ways to do it. I see other communities to do, doing it that way, not necessarily here in Fort Collins. We have some actually some rather bad examples of the way we have used public dollars to pursue economic benefits. I know we can do a much better job in the future. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go back and touch on the CSU Stadium. What is your position, Eric, on the stadium? What do you think the impacts on the community will be? And do you support a referendum? Well, I'm going to say I got conflict of interest here because I just live, you know, just a little bit north I can, of the existing stadium. I can walk down there. And I love going to the games. Um, it's a fun thing to do on Saturdays. I take my son along with me, and uh, you know, in one hand, I'm making remarks here that would encourage the CSU to build a stadium because it wasn't until I moved to that location that I really got jazzed about CSU football. And I know the downtown stadium would be very helpful in, in bringing the rest of the community in there, but there's a significant amount of impact that has to be measured as to how that would create change in the area for the residents who live down there, people who've invested in that in homes, businesses along there um, might not have ever really seen an on-campus stadium in their f future until just recently. Um, once again, the city government's role in, the, in that is going to be fairly limited just because of the way rule of law shakes out in the whole affair. But just along with that comes the responsibility to make sure that we're just looking after each other. That's really what we do in, in public life. If you're not up here to look after your neighbors, make sure that their interests are cared for, probably in the wrong business. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Again, Colorado State University is a key asset to our community. It defines the fiber of who and what we are. They have their own governing structure and their um, own methods as an institution. I respect their ability to define who and what they are and how that works. Now, when it comes to the stadium, if 
and when that stadium gets built, of course, Fort Collins has to be at the table and have addressed the issues that have major impacts on our residents. We've heard them. We know that it's transportation issues, it's noise, it's congestion, it's the issues that impact neighborhoods. And definitely we would have a seat at the table in discussing and defining um, those impacts as they, as they affect the residents of Fort Collins. Thank you. Thanks. So now we're going to the question of fracking. Karen, what should the council's role be in addressing the oil and gas boom in northern Colorado? And how would you recommend the city respond to the governor's statements that the state might sue or require negotiated compensation for mineral rights? Thank you for that question. It's been an ongoing discussion with the city of Fort Collins, and I'm sure everyone in this audience is pretty well versed on it as, as we are up here. We have always maintained that the city of Fort Collins needs to have a, the ability to address those things within our land development guidance system that can um, address the concerns of the citizens, namely the air quality issues, water issues that um, are of concern to the community. Currently, we cannot do that with state regulation. And this is major what happened. As we imposed the ban, we did address as well that we would go to the state and work on imposing le um, legislation to try and correct some of the issues that are there. Our concern has always got to be the welfare of the residents of Fort Collins, and to that end, we, we would work to continue working with the state on that issue. I think there's been a, I'm, I'm looking forward to a softening of the governor's position, and I think we've already opened a door as, as soon as he said there was this uh, possibility of looking at reimbursement. So I think there's some positives that will be coming from that. Eric, please. Uh, a, a big part of that question was, you know, the reaction that we might get from the state government exercising their legal authority to protect the mineral rights of people who own mineral rights underneath the city of Fort Collins. Um, I'm beginning on that question by saying I never would have gone down the path that Fort Collins did in terms of how it deliberated on that particular subject. The road was wide open for us to come up with a regulatory paradigm within the city limits that would have adequately protected public health and in a sense banned the practice of fracking here. That would have been a legally defensible process, a legally defensible result. We had the opportunity, we were actually going down that road initially last summer and somehow we got veered off into the idea that a ban would be a much further, much bigger signal to send. We got our 15 minutes of fame out of the ban. Now we're gonna go back to exactly where we were for. Always when you're talking about public policy like this, we should be looking forward several years. What's the end goal gonna be in the debate about fracking? The end goal will be a compromise situation that provides adequate regulations for home rule municipalities and other local author authorities. Fort Collins could have led by example by going directly to that result through compromise, through working with the industry, et cetera. Instead, I think we're back, basically back where we were about a year ago. Thanks. Now we have a transportation question. Eric, how should the city plan to support the longtime operations and maintenance of the Mac, MAX transit system? Every other comparable city in the front range of Colorado, besides Colorado Springs in Pueblo, has the RTD tax, which is a 1% sales tax that's collected on all sales that funds their transit operation. If the city government were to match through its general fund contribution to transport, the equivalent contribution per capita or per tax dollar that is spent down in RTD, we would actually have to double our general fund contribution to transport. In other words, compared to other cities, we're underfunding transit. That is gonna be a big problem because I don't think that 
anybody recognizes how difficult it is going to be or how expensive it will be to actually get that max route functioning in a near time, time frame. There are connecting routes that have to be modified. We need additional service hours, including probably Sundays, to really make it a viable transportation option to get the development incentivized along there. Could be a very expensive process, but that's something I'm very desirous of pursuing. Because quite honestly, I see developing a functioning transit system in this community to be one of the highest priorities that we need to pursue to preserve our quality of life, to keep automobile tra traffic functioning properly so that students can live in town without a car, still be mobile, still get down to the um, rest of the front range on regional transit. That's going to take a lot of work. That's going to take a lot more discussion and vision I than I think we've seen so stop. far. Thank Thanks. you. Karen, please. How fortunate we are to, to be able to begin this process of the public transportation system and rapid bus transit through the core of our community. One of the, the key elements always has been how do you fund it and support it and you know, we've been fortunate to get on the ground with um, public dollars through the Federal Transportation Administration and um, begin this project. What has happened, it's become more than a transportation corridor as we move into an economic corridor, and this will be the lifeblood of the communi community moving people forward. We've said that we are going to become the compact urban environment, and that lends itself to public transportation that moves people quickly and efficiently. It comes with a cost. It is of major concern. How do we support this? And um, I think we'll, we'll have to be working on different processes that come with it. One would hope that a lot of the economic vitality, the housing that develops along there, will lend itself to supporting that process through um, fees and um, other revenues that can be generated as we move that corridor east and west and strengthen it with um, the businesses, the cultural amenities that will go along with it. There's a lot riding on this, and a lot of it is the, you know, the future of Fort Karen, Collins. I'm going to need to ask you to stop. Thank you. Um, and now we're shifting gears to economic development. Karen, after some 40 years, is there still need for a downtown development authority? Why or why not? Oh, most definitely. All we have to do is look at the downtown and know that the success. It's what a marvelous, exciting, vibrant place to be. And we know that it just recently was named one of the best downtowns in the United States. That happens through planning, through investment, and commitment by the people who live, work, and play in that area. Uh, I can remember coming in 1976, and those of you in the audience who have, were here at that time frame, we did not have a downtown. It was not economically viable. There weren't people out and about. It was not successful. It took the vision of the people to create a downtown development authority and put that investment in there okay. into the revitalization, the re-energizing re and redevelopment. Yes, we need a downtown development authority and we need it in the future to make sure it remains vibrant in the community. That's, that's one of the great things that makes Fort Collins great. Thanks, Eric. So the, to the DDA, yeah, that's a simple yes. It's doing a great job. Um, you know, one of those things that just has happened marvelously in this community. Um, but we surely can't forget that the DDA is collecting money through tax increments, money that is diverted from other public agencies in Northern Colorado, our library, county social services, even the school district. And I'm going to depart just slightly from the, from the direct emphasis of that question to explain that Fort Collins also operates another entity, the Urban Renewal Authority, which also funds itself by collecting tax increment generated, also from the same sources. And I have to say that the Urban Renewal Authority perhaps is the worst managed public agency I have ever seen in Fort Collins. 
Uh, recently, it came forward with a report regarding tiffing the redevelopment of the mall, which was frankly an embarrassment to the city of Fort Collins, saying that it would have no impact on county finances when the county itself is struggling right now financially because of their budget circumstances and at the same time providing services that I know myself and my fellow citizens need. So I think that there needs to be significant discourse about how Fort Collins and its subdivisions, the DDA and URA, are using tax increment financing. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I got carried away. I have more questions, but uh, it's time to wrap up. So starting with Karen Wykenot, will you please take a minute and give some concluding remarks? Thank you. And thank all of you for coming out this evening and uh, listening to us and uh, the League, again, for giving us the opportunity to share what we have to say and to inform the voters on community issues. You know, the decision before the voters is whether or not there is a need to change leadership. I hope you'd agree with me that through the years we have faced the important issues together and accomplished many great things. We've created a world-class city together, a community that has a 96% approval rating is a very good place to live. I've truly enjoyed being the mayor of Fort Collins, and I would ask for your continued support and your vote this April 2nd to keep me as your mayor. Thank you. Eric? There's, there's no denying, and I'm not in any disagreement with the mayor as nobody else is. This is a fantastic place to live. Everybody I know living here counts their blessings every single day. To be living in a community that has a vibrant economy, the greatest people on earth, beautiful environment, etc. But with those advantages, we have responsibilities. When you've got it this good, it's your responsibility to figure out what you can do to make the whole country, the whole world better. Fort Collins has unique opportunities in energy and transit and other areas to do exactly that. I often say that Fort Collins often confuses its advantages with its accomplishments. Our advantages are many. Our accomplishments, not so much. I'm running for mayor because I want to go out and accomplish things, create a sane energy for our children, create regional transit systems that work, and many other benefits that we can bring to each other. It's like I said before, we do this to thank help you. each other. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So I'd like to thank both Eric Sutherland and Karen Wykenot for helping the voters understand your positions um, as you run for mayor. We'll now take a five minute break and then we'll resume with the forums for the city council districts one, three, and five. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Sidna Murshid and I will be moderating the candidate forum for the Fort Collins City Council members. City Council members are elected for four-year terms and are term limited after two terms. We have an unusual situation this year in that none of the candidates running for City Council are incumbents. There are eight candidates running for three seats. You vote for the, city, the council member only if you live in their district. City Council seats for District 1, 3, and 5 are open. A district map like this can be found, it's not very clear on the screen, but it can be found at the uh, Fort Collins website, www, what's underneath the screen too. So if you, Google, if you go to that website and then there's a tab on the right that says Council District Boundaries and you get this map. Up above this map, there's a little square. You type in your address, and you can find out which district you live in if, you, if you're confused about it. As you can see, District 1 is the, pretty much the northeast part of town. It's north of Drake and pretty much east of College. District 3 is the southeast part of town. It's, uh, it's also east of College, and it's um, south of, of Harmony. 
Drake, uh, the District 5 is this kind of funny little one here that's kind of in the shape of an L. It's west of college, I would say um, north of Swallow and maybe uh, south of Mulberry. That's, ju that's just a rough area. District 1 has four candidates. They are M.L. Johnson, Bob Overbeck, Brian Payne, and Butch Stockover. District 3 has two candidates running. They are Linda Blake and Gino Campana. District 5 also has two candidates. They are Ross, Ross Kniff and Patrick Edwards. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves and explain why they would like to serve on the city council. We're going to start on the left with Mr. M.L. Johnson and then move to his left. You can start, Mr. Johnson. Good evening. Could you turn on your mic, please? Okay, good evening, as we go. Thanks to the League of Women Voters for this invitation and the audience for coming. I would bring uh, public policy experience and lots of volunteering. My family and I moved here in 1980, and I volunteered for a wide variety of community building activities, including serving on the children's, uh, Fort Collins Children's uh, Theater Board, a homeowners association board, the PSD Foundation, two terms as elected PSD director, and I participated in City Works and the Governor's TBD Colorado Initiative. Public service is about listening, analyzing problems, and making decisions for a better future, such as preserving a better future for Irish, Putnam, Lopez, Beatty, and Lincoln schools when they were threatened for closure. I would appreciate your vote and support for City Council District 1. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Overbeck? Hi, good evening. Thank you for everyone for coming out here. I'm Bob Overbeck, running for City Council District 1. And the reason I'm running is because I believe I have the experience, knowledge, time, and dedication to serve the citizens of Fort Collins and the people of District 1. Now, I have a background in financial markets. I was a floor broker at the Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And 10 years ago, I came to Fort Collins and began raising puppies for guide dogs for the blind. Shortly after that, I began a radio show at KRFC called News on the Range. Me and other volunteers there did the show every day for several years. And we were able to bring news and information about this community, community to you every day. And I learned a lot doing that. I also served as a board member on the Fort Collins Public Access TV station where citizens could check out high-end camera equipment and do little documentaries, film a band, and actually go into the studio and edit it and put it on TV. Also was part of University Connections here in town, the Poudre River Group, and I uh, think I'm out of time here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overbeck. Mr. Payne? Hi, my name's Brian Payne. You have to excuse me, I'm new at this. I'm a little nervous. My mouth is wired for a foot in it instead of something eloquent coming out. So hopefully I won't mess up too bad. Uh, uh, my wife and I moved to Fort Collins in about 2000. We came and visited her family and I fell in love with the place. Uh, throughout the time I've been here, I've, I've owned my own small business, a small trucking company. Uh, while I was uh, doing that, I was out a lot, so I didn't really have much to do with uh, local anything because I was away quite a bit. Well, I got rid of that and have been working locally and decided to go ahead and get into the, uh, do something for the community. So, uh, uh, so I joined the race and, um, and I guess that'll do it. <laughs> like I said, a little nervous, we'll figure it out. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Stockover. Thank you, thank you all for coming and thank you for having me. My name is Butch Stockover, candidate District 1. For the past 16 years, it's been my honor to serve the city of Fort Collins. I uh, look to continue that service on city council. I believe everyone brings something to the table and what I bring is eight years experience on the planning and zoning board where I learned to work closely with city staff and city council on policy and code issues as well as work with citizens on intense land use issues. 
Before that, eight years on the Planning and Zoning Board of Appeals, where I learned to really listen to citizens and their property concerns. Decisions of City Council affect everyone, and I believe through true citizen engagement, actively listening to all very viewpoints, and holding ourselves accountable, I'll bring a real balance to the decision-making process. I'm excited about this opportunity. I've been coming to this building for 16 years. I've been sitting in this chair for 16 years, and I'm looking forward to continuing that service for another four years. Thank you all for coming, and again, my name is Butch, and I'm asking for your support and your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stockover. We're now moving to the candidates running for District 3. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Blake. Good evening. My name is Linda Blake, Fort Collins City Council candidate for District 3, and that's Linda with a Y. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Sydney and the League for giving us this opportunity to talk to you all um, and share our views on some of the important questions that are before us in the city. Um, I feel that I'm qualified to be here because I've been a business owner for 30 years. Uh, so I understand planning and uh, economics and budgeting and marketing and all the things that go into this. Um, and policy is very important to me. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to be a part of policy planning for our future. Fort Collins is a great city. It was my city of choice, and I look forward to serving you. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Mr. Campana. Thank you. Thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters uh, for putting this on tonight. Thank you for all of you that came here, uh, taking time away from your, your uh, busy schedules, and all, all of you at home who are watching this. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity uh, with this being uh, broadcast continuously or frequently um, throughout the uh, balloting process. Uh, gives people an opportunity to get to know us a little bit better. It's a very short campaign season. Um, from the last date you can register as a candidate to the date you get your ballots is about three weeks. Doesn't give you a lot of time to get to know uh, who the candidates are or what they're, what they're about. Uh, I hope tonight to al allow you to get to know me a little bit better and hopefully earn your trust and your, vo and your vote on, on April 2nd or sooner than that if you mail it in sooner. Um, I was born here in Fort Collins. I'm, I'm one of the very few natives. Uh, married my high school sweetheart who's here tonight. And uh, we have four children, three daughters and one son. Um, I went through the school system, the Pudar One school system, and my children have gone through that. I was born at PVH, and my children were born at PVH. Kind of neat to do. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time coaching the kids in the community and being involved. 19 years ago, uh, there was a vacancy in the city council, and uh, I tried to get appointed. Didn't, wasn't successful at the time, but ever since then, I've been, I've been involved. I've been on many, many, many boards, from budget committees to uh, energy codes to recently I'm on the uh, Planning and Zoning Board in my seventh year. Um, the Oil and Gas Advisory Committee, Landmark Preservation Committee are just the committees I'm on right now. I've tried to hone my skills over the last 19 years in preparation for the job of a city council person, the, the, the person that helps set policy and represents a particular district. And I'm hopeful that uh, through uh, my sharing of my thoughts here tonight, I'll help to uh, earn your, your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Campana. We'll move on to District 5 and Mr. Kniff. Thank you, and thanks to the League for hosting us. The uh, League always provides great information for the voters to help them make an informed decision. And thank you to the audience. Look forward to your questions. My name is Ross Kniff, and I'm running for City Council in District 5, and I, I hope to earn your vote. I've, uh, my wife and I came to Fort Collins uh, in 1987. We chose Fort Collins as a place to raise our family, and we just fell in love with the place and have uh, stayed in love with the place ever since. And that's really why I'm running. I want to help to preserve those things, those aspects of Fort Collins that uh, made us fall in love with it in the first place. Uh, the, uh, the parks and the natural areas, the city services, the school district, uh, the local businesses, the, uh, the community, just everything about Fort Collins is, is fantastic. And we've heard many other people tonight talk about that. 
there are things that we need to do to keep that going, and I'll use my experience to help that happen. I have eight years of experience on the elected Poudre School District Board of Education, uh, elected two terms there, I served as its president. So I'm familiar with the uh, needs and desires of people to have access to their elected officials. Uh, for them, you run into them in the supermarket, you run into them at the uh, restaurant, and uh, you find out that uh, one of the joys of local government is that they can tell you their concerns, and they can give you immediate feedback on whether you're doing a good job or perhaps not so good a job. And uh, the I can bring that experience and I know what that means to the people and so I'll bring that. I bring my experience as a both a small business owner as well as a high-tech employee and manager of a worldwide organization. I can bring that to the city and help the city make rational decisions based on numbers, based less on um, just raw emotion. And as I said, I do hope that I can earn your vote tonight and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kniff. Now for Mr. Edwards. Well, hey, folks. Um, <clears throat> nice to be here. I'm going to go up and uh, say that to beginning, um, and I'll explain it in my closing remarks. But I'm going to say um a lot. My face is going to twitch. I'm going to sweat and um, drink a lot of water. I'm not lying to you. Um, I have a <laughs> – I'll explain that later. But um, just to get that out on the beginning. Um, for one thing I wanted to say, um, I am running in District 5. Uh, I went to Bowder, and I went to Blevins, and I went to Weber for a semester, and I went to uh, Poudre High School. And um, uh, Rocky is in my district, but um, accidentally I got a class ring, and I didn't want it to be silver and blue like everyone else, so I did gold and my birthstone, which is ruby, so I have a Pooter School District class ring, or Pooter class ring that looks like I went to Rocky. So <laughs> that was just an interesting coincidence. Um, I have a minute left, um, so I will, even though I said I would not say I have a minute left, I want to talk about three things, and you'll hear me say these over and over again, and that's the point. Bands, brands, and beer. Bands, to me, means any kind of artist who creates beauty. If you do something beautiful from computer code to carpentry, from Foco Mix to First Friday Gallery Walk, and so much more. I have an article about all the bicyclists going down um, together as part, of the, um, as part of the Fort Collins Bicycle Industry Alliance. Um, then we moved on to brands. Brands include Woodward and Otterbox, and Fort Collins City Government is even a brand. And then, of course, beer. I'm Lutheran. And a uh, former Catholic, um, kind of a Catherine, um, put that out there, not as a litmus test, but just because I love uh, my church. Um, and uh, we, I enjoy beer. <laughs> um, so the Brewing District, Anheuser-Busch InBev, uh, the Mayor of Fort Collins, Hops and Berries, and so much more. Um, we do live in a great city, so thanks. OK, thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the questions. And for the purpose of allowing viewers to compare and contrast the answers of candidates running for the same seat, I will ask questions in a manner which might appear random. It really isn't. So we'll start with, with uh, Mr. Campano, Campana for District 3. And the first question is, what are our top, the, what are the top three issues facing our community and why are they critical? Thank you. Um, I'll kind of summarize it with um, a clearly articulated vision of what we want our city to look like 20 or 30 years out is top issue in my mind. From that, we, all the other issues fall in line. Um, so when we discuss transportation, growth, uh, redevelopment, uh, water storage, all that is under this underlying um, umbrella of vision. And um, I think today we don't have a clearly art articulated uh, vision as a city. We could work on that. I hope to help bring perspectives from all the boards I've worked on and committees that I've worked on as well as my work experience to help hone that vision and bring that forward. But when we look underneath that umbrella of vision, clearly um, the redevelopment and fact that we are no longer 
um, pushing out our boundaries of Fort Collins, uh, redevelopment will be a critical um, uh, challenge uh, as we grow as a community. And how we're going to facilitate <clears throat> that redevelopment <clears throat> um, is something that we need to consider in our land use code and in all the discussions we have. Um, I'm sorry, did I miss something? <clears throat> oh, okay. <clears throat> um, with water storage, transportation, and transit. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Campana. Ms. Blake? <laughs> I, can, I can say that I have a lifelong commitment to healthy communities. And the way I see a healthy community is uh, healthy people, healthy environment, healthy economy. And all of those things are included in, in the issues that I consider most important. Um, but I have two primary issues. One is, is water because it's critical to the development, the growth, the existence of every community. And the second one is transportation. And I see opportunity after being here for a couple of years, I, uh, I realized that uh, the honeymoon was over and I began to see other than, Fort Collins is a lovely place to live, I just love it. But, um, then the more you get to know a place or a person, uh, you see that there's maybe room for, uh, for uh, improvement. So uh, I feel like it's time now for me to step up and maintain my commitment to a healthy community by participating in the policy of uh, improving Fort Collins or maintaining it. Thank you very much, Ms. Blake. We'll now move on to um, Mr. Edwards in running for District 5. Do you need me to repeat the question? That would be great. Okay, what are the top three issues facing our community okay. and why are they critical? Um, yeah, we get this top three question a lot. Um, and I kind of uh, almost reject the concept of the question because there are so many issues, um, it's still a good question, but um, there's so many issues that people care about and they're passionate about and they just love in this town. Um, three things that, I will say three things. Um, we really have to look into what water uh, rates are gonna be next year. Um, I've heard that the breweries have concerns about elevated rates um, for their business. Um, and my answer kind of changes because of who, citizens actually talking to me. Um, number two, um, always uh, we have issues of transportation. Um, just because we must face the fact that we are a metropolitan area, we are no longer the college town. Um, I can say that because I had two uncles who went to Cardo A and M three years after it was established um, through my family. So they came here when it was only a college <laughs> and little town. Um, and so uh, we may have this issue of, just to say this, we have an issue of uh, experience. Um, I'm a 14th generation American, so I have the concerns of that in my family and good governance and continuation from generation to generation. Thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Kniff. Uh, yes, thank you. The, uh, the top three, the first is going to have to be still the economy and jobs. There are a lot of people, friends and neighbors of ours, who are still struggling with unemployment or underemployment. Uh, and so we need to find ways to stimulate local businesses. And I, I particularly would hope that we can uh, find businesses that would be um, providing goods and services to other local Fort Collins businesses and uh, residents to have that magnification effect of money circulating within our local economy. Uh, the next issue is to maintain the uh, character and quality of life of Fort Collins. That includes things like our single family neighborhoods, making sure that those are uh, safe, family friendly, uh, making sure that um, our natural environment and our parks and our other amenities are maintained and extended as the city continu continues to grow in development. 
And finally, um, we need to make sure that we maintain the quality and cost effectiveness of our city services. And that includes uh, the most important interactions that any of us have with our city government, like when you turn the light switch on and it works, or when you turn the tap on and clean, safe water pours out of it. Um, we need to make sure that uh, we are able to provide those services and provide them well. And that actually means looking forward to when uh, energy sources change or as uh, our climate changes and water becomes even more scarce to find solutions to provide those necessary services for residents and businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kniff. We'll move on to District 1 candidates and we'll start with Mr. Overbeck. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I, I know the question. Okay. Uh, top three issues. Uh, one of the top issues, I think, is the city delivering high-quality services in a fiscally responsible manner. And I also think that the CSU stadium issue is an issue that's going to be with us for a while. And I think uh, citizens need to have more voice in that discussion. Neighborhoods are worried about the impact of that stadium, uh, the pollution from that stadium, the noise pollution, the air quality, the traffic jams. The impact to the citizens of that neighborhood is very important, and I think that's still going to be an issue. Another one is fracking. I don't think this issue is over anytime soon. Yes, we may have had a ban on it, but I think uh, for a long time there's going to be a conversation about what we do with fracking, and I'm glad that the citizens of Fort Collins took a stand and spoke up and said that they don't want it in their community. Another important issue that will be important is uh, water quality. Uh, with the fire that happened here over the last summer, I think it was a game changer. I think water quality is going to be very important. And what happens when the snow melts and that silt from the fire goes into Poudre River, I think we have to follow it very closely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overbeck. Mr. Payne? Uh, my top three in no particular order would be water, jobs, and affordable housing. And a lot of attention gets paid to student housing, but we need affordable housing for everyone. Um, so the, the the housing, I think the, the big issue is development delays. The, the project on college uh, by the Dairy Queen, it's had so many names, I can't remember which ones they are. But it, that one was actually started in, in 2008, then tabled, then started again in 2010, and now it's just getting finished. Really, one minute? Okay. Um, so the, we need to... to stop the delays with, with the housing. Water, Halligan expansion's a good start. Uh, that's a new one to me. I come from the East Coast. If you need more water, you just drill a well. So that's a whole new game to me. And the jobs, uh, that one's really important to me because as of two weeks ago, I am unemployed. So I think we need to retain our employers that we have, like Woodward. That's pretty high on the priority list right now. And Time's about up, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Stockover? Thank you very much. I'll have to talk quickly. This is a big question. Uh, thank you very much. I'll have to talk quickly. This is a big question. In the order, jobs, growth, and resources. When we talk about jobs, it's economic health. And when we look at our report of what the city rates us as, we do so well in so many areas. Environmental health, 87%. High-performing government, 69%. Cultural resources, 88%. Safety, which is big, 91%. Transportation, 85%. Economic health, 58%. We're competing with every city across the front range for jobs. We have the tools. We have to be ready. We have to be proactive. Growth? Growth is reacting to the pressures outside Fort Collins. And as we hear everyone in this room, People love Fort Collins. People are moving to Fort Collins. We will have growth, so we need to work hard to stay true to the vision, which is city plan and our comprehensive plan. I wish I had more time to talk about that. We've worked hard on city plan and the comprehensive plan in this very building for years, and I think it is a good guiding document. We need to stay true to it. We will veer to the left, to the right, but let's stay true to that vision. Third is resources. Water is very important. We have a 50-year drought plan. We need to make sure that we can live up to that. The fire is a game changer. We're changing half of our um, water source from the Poudre to the Colorado Big Thompson. It's doable. It can be better. Um, transportation. And with that, I've stopped. Like a red light on College Avenue. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Stockover. Mr. Johnson. 
Well, to begin with, uh, we need uh, a vision that, in, <clears throat> that involves where, pardon me, <clears throat> uh, how we see Fort Collins in the region. And uh, in order to do that, we need something like uh, the TBD Colorado, to, to be determined Colorado, and, and certainly to get acquainted with what is going on with Embrace Northern Colorado and, and, and decide what we want to, uh, this uh, community to be like. Uh, under that vision, then you have uh, uh, such things, and these are unranked uh, uh, jobs. Uh, one of the good things that we can, uh, I think, exploit here is that we have, uh, we have lots of ideas, but we need those ideas to be moved forward uh, with good managers, and the, the critical part is finance. If we can get finance locally, then there's good probability that those jobs will not be shipped out. Uh, water obviously is something that we need to be concerned about, which is both quality and quantity. And uh, <clears throat> the last one is uh, obviously our environment, which is the reason that everybody came here in the first place, in, or at least stays. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, the second question will start with Mr. Raskaneff, who is running in District 5. What should the future of city transportation look like and how can it best be achieved? Uh, thank you. I think uh, the future of city transportation is going to be multimodal and uh, diverse. We, uh, of course, are going to have uh, automobiles, and we need to make sure that the roads are safe and well-maintained uh, and cost-effective. A lot of people don't appreciate that a road is an ongoing investment much more than a single-time thing that you spend money on. Um, we need to find ways to build out our transit system to take the Mason Corridor as a backbone to a rational grid-based transit system, including figuring out how we can finance that cost-effectively. And then we also need to make sure that we're making room for bicycles and pedestrian traffic. Uh, it's by far the most cost-effective way of transportation. There are many parts of the city which are not friendly to pedestrians and bicycles, and uh, I, for one, don't want to drive for the rest of my uh, life, and I hope to get to the point where I can be able to bike and walk to many more places than I can now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kniff. Now, Mr. Edwards, District 5. I agree with a lot of the, those statements. Um, Transportation is always a big issue. Um, you know, it shouldn't take 35 minutes to get across town on a 2 o'clock on a Wednesday. I only know this because I was trying to get to a brewery from Fort Hunt, from FRCC um, at one time, and I timed it because I was so frustrated. Um, we shouldn't be afraid um, to say things that and have come up with crazy ideas that may seem crazy but do work, like getting rid of left turns on college. Um, UPS has a no left turn policy that they put in about six to seven years ago. Um, it increases their route times because you have to plan out your routes um, and it's more cost effective. That's a kind of an interesting idea. I thought of maybe we should have left lanes should be five miles an hour faster than right lanes. Um, and then that would deter so people who are driving faster can go in the left lane. If you're taking a right turn, you go on the right. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can do. Um, for bicycling, that would I know would help. People need to know the bicycling rules of the state of Colorado. You must drive with traffic, not against it. Um, you're considered a vehicle. So when you're driving the wrong way, I can't see you because I'm not assuming you're going to be there because that would be like assuming somebody driving the wrong way on Mason. Don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I'll end my time. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. We'll move to District 1 candidates and start with Mr. Payne. And the question is, what should the future of city transportation look like and how can it best be achieved? This topic's pretty, uh, pretty important. I've been in transportation for 20 years. And um, I think the public transportation system here in Fort Collins uh, could definitely be more efficient. Uh, it's an hour between stops. Um, it, the city's set up in a grid, but the buses aren't. Uh, I think a grid system for the buses would be good. One of the things that I've, I've learned, a friend of mine's on the Commission for Disabilities, and people with disabilities have a hard time getting around this city. And it's a not well-known commission uh, they haven't had a, a, a council person 
at a regular meeting in over two years. And it's hard for these people to get around. I mean, it's hard for, for someone without a disability to get around in the public transportation system, let alone someone with disabilities. And uh, the funding has been cut to uh, like Larimer Lift. Uh, that went away. And uh, so we need to look at uh, and sure up the funding for our public transportation, and especially for uh, people with disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Stockover? For this one, I have to leave my glasses on because I've been making all sorts of notes. The future of transportation, that's, that's where we live and breathe down here on the Planning and Zoning Board. And we hear things like traffic study, level of service, vehicle miles traveled. And one we don't talk about is hours spent idling. Um, economic health comes into this. Economic health funds infrastructure. Um, and there's just so many catchphrases to it. But what it boils down to, to me, transportation within the neighborhoods, transportation down our main corridors, and transportations regionally. And they all three are completely different animals, but they're so integrated and interwoven. Um, we have a whole section about transportation in our city plan. We study this, we work hard on it. It's, it's a, a living, moving, breathing document. But what's important to me is that we realize we're a very mobile society. We're very fortunate that technology has kicked in. We are able to move more cars today throughout the city than we were able to 30 years ago through advancements in technology. I think we need to realize that we have to have the vision to know that things are going to advance. But keep in mind that people love Colorado. I think there's like 4 million visitors to Rocky Mountain National Park every year. People love to travel. We need to keep that in mind. Thank we need to... I think your time's up. <laughs> okay, Sorry. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stockover. Mr. Johnson? Uh, the question is, what should the future of city transportation look like, and how can it best be achieved? <clears throat> the future uh, transportation, looking at uh, two aspects of it. One is local, and the other one is regional. Uh, dealing with the, the local aspects, uh, transportation is, involves having roads and getting, or getting people uh, from one place to the other where they want to go and, and fairly efficiently. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we can do fairly quickly is to uh, improve our parallels. And what's a parallel? Well, there's some roads that seem to be parallel that really aren't in terms of uh, effective transportation, such as horse tooth is really not a, a good parallel uh, if you want to go to uh, I-25 because then you have to get back on to Harmony. Uh, the Harmony has a couple of parallels that could be improved, particularly uh, the Prospect Road. That needs to go into a four-lane, which would help take the pressure off of uh, Harmony and keep people going, uh, going east when they could be going, uh, instead of going south then before they go east. Uh, the regional, we're way behind on even thinking about and acting on uh, mass, tra mass transit uh, heading south, perhaps even picking up some of the passengers on the rail line from Cheyenne, and there's, there's certainly talk of going all the way through Denver to, uh, to southern cities. But we're way behind on, on getting on that, and we need to start working with other, in, other governmental entities, uh, which would be certainly Loveland, uh, Longmont, et cetera, to try to get fast track on the fast track. Thank you very much. Mr. Overbeck? Yes, the future of transportation here is I think we need to integrate MAX into transport. I also think the future of transportation in Fort Collins is bicycles and the Mason Line and a city that is walkable. And when we have uh, the, uh, the North College Redevelopment Project build out, I think it will give a lot more openness for people to move about in this community. And now Fort Collins is going to be a leader here because we're really the only community here other than Loveland, Windsor, that's putting in a major transportation line. And we're going to be able to build out from that. So Mason is the spine. Eventually, when that comes online, we'll be able to build out for east and west from the Mason line. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're moving on to District 3, and we'll start with Ms. Blake. 
What should the future of city transportation look like and how can it best be achieved? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll very quickly tell you a story about uh, last summer, my grandson was visiting, he's eight, and he noticed that Fort Collins was a better place to live and ask to live here because we had bicycle lanes, and so bicycles are very important uh, to him. He said, if, if, we, if we had bicycle lanes where I live, mommy and daddy wouldn't have to drive me places. Uh, so I thought that was very observant of him and very accurate. You know, I do appreciate what Fort Collins has done to incorporate bicycles into our transportation. But I also see a need for, particularly in District 3, for some east-west connectors if, of a smaller vehicle, perhaps electric, I don't know, um, to connect to the existing bike line, lanes or bike routes, or not bike routes, bus routes. I'll get it straight. Um, because it's very, very difficult to get around in District 3 without a car. And if our goal is to reduce fossil fuels and get out of our cars, then it's a, it's a situation, it's a challenge. It's one of those many challenges that we need to address and address very quickly. Thank you very much. Mr. Campana? Well, I think, I think one would have a hard time arguing that Fort Collins is a vehicle-dependent community as it's laid out today. It's just, uh, it's convenient to, to get in your vehicle and drive to and from. We might complain about uh, traffic congestion, but compared to other cities, it is quite easy to get across town today. However, we, did, we made a couple changes in, in our vision of what Fort Collins is gonna look like in the future. One took place in 1996, when uh, the Mason Street Corridor plan was established, which I sat on that board. And at that time, we, we agreed to a plan to put transit in Fort Collins, to put the Mason Street Corridor in place. Another key thing happened in 2004, the city plan uh, advisory committee suggestion to council and council agreement on was not to, to increase our growth boundary area. That means we are no longer making our city larger. We're developing from within. And as we do that, we're gonna continue to see pressure on our roads. And when we see pressure on our roads, we're gonna see increase in usage in our transit system. It's gonna happen as long as we adhere to our plan. If we embrace the investment we made in Mason Street Corridor, which is critical as that's being developed right now with $86 million being invested in that corridor, we need to embrace that as a community. And as we continue to see pressures on our streets, we may relieve one intersection, but what do we do? When Timberline gets congested, we use LeMay. When LeMay gets congested, we use College. We move around. The, the level of detail to adjustment to our intersections is boggling. I had a traffic engineer tell me he adjusted the ti timing sequence of the signal at Drake and Timberline by a half a second and took the intersection out of failure. We need to embrace the investments we made in our community. Thanks. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the third question, and it will be about fracking. What should the city's role be in mitigating the effects of the oil and gas boom in northern Colorado? Should it be a concern for residents? And we will start with Mr. Stockover from District 1. Fracking is a very, very emotional issue. I don't think there's anybody in this room who would want an oil well in their backyard. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would want an oil company fracking in the backyard. I, too, was on the original oil and gas advisory board. I'm on record as saying we need to work with this issue collaboratively with our regional partners. Quite frankly, we're very fortunate that there's little oil under Fort Collins. We did have a plan where we could, through code, work with the oil companies. We took another path. We decided to send a strong message to our neighboring communities, we're with you. We understand this is a big emotional issue. Did we make the right decision? I cannot say. But we made a decision, and I think we need to continue down that path of understanding the impacts to communities. We'll see how it plays out. I look forward to continuing to discuss it, 
As I walk the neighborhoods, this is an issue that's very near and dear to many of our hearts. And um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stockover. Mr. Johnson, who is also from District 1. <clears throat> the short answer is uh, that we do not need fracking uh, in the city limits. So that is our jurisdiction. However, uh, there, are, uh, there are other answers, uh, probably other aspects of that, one of which is uh, there's a little sign that you see often in, in uh, uh, boutique stores, and that is if you break it, you buy it. Okay. The, the governor has positioned himself so that uh, Fort Collins or the citizens would need to compensate uh, the oil companies. On the other hand, if air quality is, is uh, air quality, water quality, and uh, vibrations from the explosions actually compromise a person's house, then and the and the um, the value goes down, then the little sign says, uh, "You break it, you bought it." Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Overbeck. Yes, I think we did a good job in banning fracking, and I think if the oil and gas industry broke Fort Collins, they won't buy it. I also think that uh, the city made a right decision to take a stand and ban fracking. They followed the citizens' wish, and uh, there's really nothing more to say but to uh, support the ban. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Overbeck. Mr. Payne, do you want, I'll repeat the question. What should the city's role be in mitigating the effects of the oil and gas boom in northern Colorado? Should it be a concern for residents? I don't think, uh I think they were on the right track last year when they were talking about tighter regulations. I don't think the ban was the right move uh, because of the, the pending lawsuits. I mean, I even knew uh, the, the CEO told me that there would be lawsuits, uh, and I'm not even on the council yet, hopefully. Um, so I think, that was, uh, I think that was the wrong move. I think we should have been stricter with it. It, with the regulation, and I also think that uh, it's kind of hypocritical since we have generators at uh, the power plant that use natural gas. We have uh, three of them, I think, and that comes from fracking. So we're saying, yeah, we'll use it as long as it's not from our community. So I think it was, uh, I think uh, city council should have been down at the, at the state house saying we want tighter regulations and, and or let us ban it, but uh, don't do the ban with a threat of lawsuits. Thank you, Mr. Payne. We'll now move to District 3, Mr. Campana. Thank you. I'll first say that um, as an environmental engineer, an engineer that's worked on water quality on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal when we were taking water samples out there um, wearing um, contamination suits, having worked in South, all over Southeast Asia setting up distribution networks for air quality monitoring. This issue is upsetting to me. Um, I'm angry that we have allowed fracking to take place and have it excluded from the Clean Water Act with regards to disclosure of what is being uh, injected into our earth. I don't want to trust people as to what's going on there. I think that's the, the, the biggest flaw with fracking is the trust me. Having said that, I did, I did take the challenge to sit on the Oil and Gas Advisory Committee that was appointed by council. And our purview was land use code, and we were limited to discussions about what color would the pump be, um, how tall it would be, what could we do about sound. But clearly, the discussion drove to and reduced down to safety. And the question was, if we allow fracking and it's unsafe, that's difficult to unwind. But if we don't allow fracking, and we find out later that it is safe, and then we allow it to take place, we haven't really lost much. The resource is still on our ground. It's been there quite, quite longer than we've been here. So um, I think that was the position that, um, that, we, that we took. And um, I would like to have seen our council to just continue to work with the state with regards to the laws around the fracking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Campana. Ms. Blake, also running for District 3. I supported the ban on fracking uh, because I believe that if we, excuse me, 
<clears throat> if we take the direction of, of regulation, that's just waving a white flag of surrender to the oil and gas industry. Um, it's never worked in, a, in any other state that I know about. Um, and I agree that the, uh, as far as compensation to the oil and gas industry, I could possibly consider that if I know more about it, um, but only if the risk benefit ratio is, is equal. Uh, are they going to compensate me for my life if, we're, if they're wrong about the, the, uh, the threat, the potential threat of fracking? Uh, so I would, I would prefer not to do it until we know more about it, until they tell us what's in it, and uh, we can, over the long haul, identify just exactly what the risk-benefit ratio is. Thank you very much, Ms. Blake. We'll move on to District 5 candidates and start with Mr. Edwards. And the question was, oh, what I got it. Oh, I you got it? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, one thing where um, I, I support fully the ban because, and this is how it needs to get explained, and Jerry, um, during the, you know, the loudness and everyone else, uh, Horak did a great explanation of it. We did not vote for option A, which was banning oil and gas exploration in the city. We voted for option B, which is just fracking, fracking materials and fracking, and fracking storage while continuing the moratorium. Now you might say, why would you continue a moratorium while you're banning it? The moratorium was put in place so that we could continue the regulation. So while where the ban is in effect, we are going to be doing the regulation. The question was for Fort Collins in northern Colorado. I know out in the east, in parts of Larimer County, they want to move it closer in than the 500 feet because of you're on a house on a farm and nobody actually lives in that house. So if it's 100 or 50 feet away, it doesn't make a difference. But here in Fort Collins, we want to make it 700 feet. The real issue about it to me that got me passionate about going up and talking was the threat from the state government. I don't want Hickenlooper and the oil and gas industry coming into Fort Collins or into any community and threatening them while we were still talking about the vote. They said, we're going to sue you, we're going to come after you, and that we should have cowered down to that. You don't cower down to tyranny. You don't cower down to fear. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Kniff? Thank you. Um, much has been said about the council should have perhaps let the regulatory process play out, but one of the things that is uh, maybe missed in that discussion is the fact that the city of Longmont tried exactly that tactic and the state sued them anyway. So trying to go down that route and uh, expecting that the state wouldn't uh, respond uh, was actually not going to happen. So therefore I support the ban. Uh, it definitely has uh, put a... Uh, uh, a slowdown or a, a stop sign on the, the rapid move of that industry uh, into this area. The, the bigger question is what about northern Colorado? And I think personally that we should put the brakes on the exploration and extraction of natural gas and oil in northern Colorado until we can prove that it has no fugitive methane emissions, that it has no fugitive benzene and other volatile organic compounds, that it has no environmental uh, effects and other uh, health and safety issues. Once all those things are in place, then we can consider restarting it. But at this point, we're left with the oil industry unregulated and uh, severely under inspected by a very small number of state inspectors. So I think that the city's ban helps put us in, in line to help support getting that conversation moving forward and getting the right things to happen on a statewide level. I hope that we can work with our legislators and ultimately with the governor and the oil and gas industry to get to a point where our health and safety are not threatened. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kniff. The, the, we'll now go to the fourth question, and we'll start with Ms. Blake, who's running for District 3. What is your position on the proposed stadium and its impact on the Fort Collins community? Do you support a referendum? Well, the stadium is not in my district. <laughs> 
for starters. Uh, as I understand it, the properties are owned by the university, and they can make whatever decision they choose. It's, it's their money and their property. Um, it's, it's, it's going to impact the entire city. I recognize that. I'm not naive about that. Um, but what can the city do in light of the fact that it's the university's money and the university's property? I'm not sure. I don't have access to that information. So I don't, I don't understand, I know I don't fully understand because I don't have access to the information that uh, what the city can do about it. Thank you very much. Mr. Campana? Well, let me see if I can uh, answer that. Uh, it's a good question and it is uh, one more opportunity for good policy setting and leadership. I can tell you that having served on the Planning and Zoning Board for seven years, it's been frequent that the university or government entity has uh, school, the school district has come forward with projects and we are allowed a, a, a courtesy review and um, as a city. And we can comment and usually they, they will take our comments and try to do them. Um, but beyond that, we really don't have a purview over the stadium itself. Now, the impacts of that stadium, the transportation, um, sound mitigation, parking, we certainly can have some uh, say in that. And um, my position is this. I got my oldest daughter here tonight who's 18 and we're touring universities right now. Uh, university is now like a business and they are challenged with getting more out-of-state students in the seats to, to pay teachers, to keep professors in, in place. And not having an on-site stadium, on-campus stadium, is a challenge for our university. I think the university is a critical component to our community and if they believe to be competitive, they need to have a stadium, we need to, to look at that and evaluate it and see how we can do it, minimizing the impact to our community. As far as a referendum, if it's a citizen initiative, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Campana. We'll go to District 5 and start with Mr. Kniff. Thank you. Well, the proposed uh, stadium is in District 5, and uh, the existing Hughes Stadium is not far from where I live, at least. It's about three-quarters of a mile. So I, I admit that I have a, a vested interest in this outcome. I've been knocking on hundreds of doors uh, as I've been campaigning, and I've uh, found that uh, many people share my concern with the proposed stadium. I, uh, I do acknowledge that CSU has the right to build the stadium whenever and wherever they please. However, um, I would hope that they could somehow take into account the desires of the people of Fort Collins, which I think we don't actually have a complete read on. I would support a referendum uh, coming forward so that we could get a, a much uh, better read. And in fact, I would support uh, City Council putting that on the ballot. I wish they had put it on already. Um, in addition, I uh, agree with uh, others who said that we really do need to make sure that we can find ways to make sure that the taxpayers of Fort Collins are not suffering the burden of mitigation for noise, for traffic, for parking, for other issues that come with a stadium located much more in the center of town. And uh, so, as I said, um, oh, the other final thing is that uh, as much has been made of the business case for the stadium. However, I wish that we could spend as much time talking about general state support of higher education in Colorado and the fact that that has been decreasing and that is the real root cause of the issues that we've been seeing in declining CSU revenues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kniff. Mr. Edwards? Okay, I'm gonna talk really fast because we only have a minute and a half and I know a lot about this subject. For one thing, on CSU, about 10% of the students are for it, 10% are against it, and 80% really don't care. I'm in the 80% that I know if CSU wants to build it, they can because we have no say. Um, I grew up at Hughes. Um, you know, I was five, four years old when we got season tickets. And then we got rid of our, we had them for 13 or 14 years. We never became Rams Club members, but um, we got up to second row. And I got rid of my, and my mom who got rid of her tickets because they fired <clears throat> Sonny or made him leave. Um, I'm an unabashed Sonny Lubick fan. I love Sonny. He's, um, it's funny when we talk since I'm so tall, but um, number two is because of 
you move to here because it's a college town, but then when we have a college, you get mad because it's a college. Um, I go to Clemson University the last two years and go watch football. Um, for one thing, you can't buy beer because it's on a uh, city campus. 40% um, of the revenue at Hughes comes from alcohol sales um, and on a dry campus with an on-campus bar. <laughs> um, what a great city, what a great country. Um, so come and talk to me. Um, I'm a young person, I understand. We're gonna have impacts. Um, I think we can come together. There's noise ordinances, there's already things into effect. Let's not spend a ton of money. And uh, yeah, but just come to talk to me. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. We'll go to District 1 candidates and start with Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> I like Sunny too, but I don't have a horse in this race. I, I, I have yet to go to a, uh, even though I like Sunny, I have yet to go to a football game, and I probably don't intend to go to one if it is on campus. So if, that's the disclaimer. Uh, it also has to do with jurisdiction. The uh, city has, uh, uh, even though it surrounds CSU, it has no jurisdiction. It on programs our, our, our uh, property. Uh, however, the city does have a very significant, uh, should have a very significant voice in the, in the matter. Uh, first of all, identifying all of the possible impacts on uh, of, of a stadium as is being proposed and trying to, to mitigate those. And, uh, and other than that, uh, just uh, trying to work with, the, with CSU if that does come to pass rather than uh, uh, being obstructionist. However, if someone wants to put the signatures together for a referendum, well, power to them. That's the, that's the American way. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Overbeck? Yes, I love Fort Collins and I love CSU and I love the collaboration between these two great organizations. But when I heard about the proposed stadium uh, and I spoke to many of my neighbors, it was a year ago, actually a year ago today on a beautiful spring day where I uh, walked my neighborhood, talked to many of my neighbors and they were all concerned about the proposed stadium. So after knocking on many doors and talking to all my neighbors, they asked me, Bob, would you go and speak to the Board of Governors at CSU and let them know what the potential impact would be to our neighborhood, what the impact would be on Prospect Avenue, what the impact would be on College Avenue, what would happen if a train came through town. And uh, another thing that came up on the proposed stadium is uh, I spoke to a fireman not too long ago who drives an engine. Actually, I was walking the neighborhoods up around the Richards Lake area, and he explained how that stadium could be detrimental to emergency vehicles, that they, al they already wait a long time to get past the train when it comes through town or traffic. And he says they sit there very pensive waiting for traffic to go through. So they're nervous to do their job. So I don't think the stadium would be a good idea to be coming into the neighborhoods there. Now, I'm on record for months coming into city council, actively speaking out to put a referendum on the ballot so the citizens could have a conversation with CSU to see if they wanted the stadium. And I know 67% of the students said that they didn't want the stadium when CSU did their own analysis. I just wish CSU would have gone out to the community and asked how the community felt about that stadium instead of just shutting them out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overbeck. Mr. Payne? Yeah, this, um, this is one of the first questions that uh, a gentleman out there wrote to me asking me uh, what my position was. And um, it's been said that it, it, it's their land, they can do it. Um, the traffic problem, uh, we have that, it'll be eight days out of the year or so. We have that now. It'll, it'll just be pushed over to prospect. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more, more that I'm not seeing. Um, the referendum, I, I would say yes. I have a big problem with his, uh, with the, the reasoning, build it and they will come, the, the good players. I just, I don't think that's a, a reason uh, to build it. Um, personally, uh, as in city council wise, like I said, it, it's really not, we should see what the parking issue, I think that'll be the bigger issue between the, the traffic and, and anything else. I think the parking, uh, where are all these people going to park? And somebody said out at Hughes, where Hughes is, well, okay, <laughs> then why are we doing that? It's better tailgating out there anyway. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Stockover? Uh, thank you very much. I think this is another highly emotional um, issue. And it reminds me of one, I mean, there's very few issues that have brought as much passion out in the people as this one has, both for and against. And it reminds me of one that I was involved with many, many years ago, and that was the trolley track down Mountain Avenue. Some people had a vision of let's restore the trolley and put the track back in. That's one of the issues that divided Fort Collins like you couldn't believe. People were, you know, as I'm out there just as a volunteer, shoveling gravel, trying to put the track in, people would come by and throw things at us. Um, people were sabotaging the tree moving equipment. It was just amazing. And we built that track, and now it's one of the beloved um, assets of our community. Things happen, and I think that the people should have a voice, and I think they have a strong voice through things like SOS, Save Our Stadium Hughes. I reached out to them, and I sat through that presentation. I've also sat through many presentations with CSU right here in these chambers. Um, well, no, actually, at the other place, <laughs> City Hall, or the Planning Department, but they bring us their plans and let us review them. What I'll bring on this issue is, if the stadium is built, I'm great at analyzing the impacts to the neighborhoods. If the neighborhoods come to me, I'll be a strong voice for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we just have time for one more question before the conclusion. And to squeeze this question in, could we just uh, limit it to one minute in answers? Okay, this one, we're going to start <laughs> with Mr. Edwards running in District 5. And it is, is it wise to offer incentives to existing or new businesses to expand or relocate in Fort Collins? Please explain your answer. Okay, first thing, since it was kind of directly directed to me, when they send out a survey to the students, 90% of us just throw it in the trash because it's only on email. So they only get like 11%. So you really have to be passionate about it to, which is what my whole argument was. 10% is really passionate, 10% is against. Now to get on to incentives. That's just the truth. <laughs> um, passionate um, about incentives. As long as they're available to every small business from a one person up to uh, Sears Roebuck, then yeah. Um, you know, there's a thing where I've been talking about, I'm a unabashed capitalist, um, free enterprise system, and if they'll come after your, in terms of, the, we're talking about incentives, but if they'll come after Sears Roebuck and give that, force that sale, this is a threat, not that they're going to do it. If they will sell that to another company, what are you gonna do with your small business? You don't have their lawyers. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Kniff? Uh, thank you. So uh, I would say that the way that we're doing it today is certainly not wise. The, uh, it's very ad hoc. It uh, really depends on the loud voices or who has the uh, ability to pay their staff to come lobby the city staff for a large incentive package and I would really like us to get to some way of being able to do a more rational assessment of these incentives and the pros and cons and the opportunity cost of giving out a large package to somebody like a Woodward or a Navago. Um, at this point though it's really hard to tell whether we're doing a good job or not because we don't even have any performance metrics on the incentives we give out. So I, I would say that it, it could be useful to give out incentives to sectors. I agree that we should make them fairly available, have a rational process, and have an objective process for evaluating the incentives if we choose to do some type of incentive. But the way we do it right now is uh, um, very uh, unwise. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move to District 1 candidates and start with Mr. Overbeck. Is it wise to offer incentives to existing or new businesses to expand or relocate in Fort Collins? Please explain. Well, we want to take care of our own local businesses, but I wasn't for the Avago uh, corporate handout that uh, came through City Council. And uh, we do need to have uh, performance metrics to know how we measure these incentive packages. I'd like to see the City Council 
do more uh, metrics when it comes to TIFs and things like that nature. I mean, if the city can go ahead and uh, do a dashboard on the budget, I think we can do a dashboard on TIFs and how we can measure them better. And so citizens and voters can distinguish what's a good deal and what's a bad deal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overbeck. Mr. Payne? The, uh, I have a problem with the, the TIFs, the tax increment financing, because that takes money from other agencies uh, like the county, schools, stuff like that. Uh, we're handing those out like candy, it seems like. Um, incentives like, sure, we'll use eminent domain on, on Sears. I don't like that incentive. Uh, but for Woodward, where you're going to get uh, incentives for a long-term employer, then yes, incentives are good. I, I think we should. Um, the TIFs, again, I, we have to reevaluate how much we're using of those. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Stockover? So my, in, my answer to incentives is this. Yes, but we need to keep three things in mind. Where's the money coming from? How will the money be spent? And to what benefit does it have to the general public? Are there legitimate constraints that need to be overcome? Those are the three questions I would ask with every one. I think occasionally we need to look over our shoulder and say, are we doing this properly? So hence, um, all the talk about coming up with guidelines. I do know this, and let's be real clear about this. I remember we used to have a welcome package, and we would advertise to that as a car dealership. If somebody bought a house here, we'd have a little coupon in there for $10 off on your oil change. I think Fort Collins is a great place to do business and we don't need to put a coupon for everybody in that welcome package. We need to look at those three questions very hard. Where's the money coming from? How does it benefit the general public? And are there really legitimate concerns that we need to overcome? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stockover. Mr. Johnson? <clears throat> the answer is that it depends. Uh, this has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, because, first of all, you have to figure out uh, the economic benefit to the community. If a particular business is only selling to Fort Collins, then there's not a big uh, economic benefit. If they're selling more than 51 percent outside, there is an economic benefit. If they have a large number of employees here, then that is an economic benefit to the community. So on a case-by-case -case basis determining uh, is there a benefit to the community, and how much is that, and what are the metrics for uh, ass ass assessing whether or not that benefit is here and is going to be here for a while. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We'll move on to the candidates for District 3 and start with Mr. Campana. Thank you. Um, thankfully, the, the quality of life we enjoy here in Fort Collins affords us the option of having to offer significant incentives or not having to offer significant incentives. Um, when we evaluate whether or not we should or should not, we should apply our strategic objectives that we've laid out in our city plan. Economic health, environmental health, safety and community, community neighborhood and livability, culture and recreation, transportation, high performing government. We need to evaluate that against every one of these businesses that comes to town. There's also times where when we're trying to force our city plan, our goals and objectives for redevelopment and infill, that conditions exist on sites that are outside of the control of that particular business and gives us an unlevel playing field in competing to attract that business to our community. In those situations, we need to evaluate assistance. It's, to me, again, we go back to um, this vision of who and what we want to be 20, 30 years out, and if we want to continue to have the quality of life, we certainly need to have primary job creators in our community. We need to keep them, we need to retain them. So do I believe in uh, business assistance? Yes when they're used strategically. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Campana. Ms. Blake? Well, <clears throat> I, I believe that the, each proposal should be evaluated on its merit. Um, that's a broad brush question, basically, to uh, incentives to all new businesses. I, I can't accept that. I would have to evaluate each proposal individually and uh, determine the risk-benefit ratio of each 
new potential employer against the overall benefits to the community as a whole. And I agree with the concept that if the city can develop a sophisticated system like Dashboard and, and they already use budgeting for outcomes, I think those principles should be applied. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move into the um, conclusion. Each of you will have one minute to wrap up and convince of you viewers to vote for you. We'll start at the end with Mr. Edwards and move to his right, the reverse of the introductions. So Mr. Edwards, would you like to be begin? All right, folks. Well, clearly you're going to see that I'm going to be the f uh, fun guy <laughs> in terms of uh, I want to be the best District 5 guy. I don't. People ask me, are you going to see future office? I was like, I haven't been elected. I, if I do, on April, sec, on April 3rd, anybody who votes for my opponent becomes my representative in the same way. Who votes for me becomes Ross. Um, sorry, <laughs> not becomes Ross, but you know how, yeah, exactly. So once this, you know, um, we'll continue on with a minute. Um, somebody asked me um, why I got in the race, and they're like, you're too nice to be um, running for city council. And, I'm, and it hurt me in my soul a little bit um, because why can't you be nice? Um, I'm sorry I kind of raised my voice, Bob. Um, uh, I think everyone here has different and unique leadership qualities that would make them um, good representatives of the city. Like I said, I'm about bands, brands, and beer. Um, and uh, you know what, come and talk to me. We'll have a fun night. Thank you very much. Mr. Kniff. Thank you. And thanks again to the League for hosting this. And thanks to everybody watching. And thanks to the voters. I uh, look forward to uh, your informed decision by April 2nd. I uh, do hope that uh, I can earn your vote. I will continue to be walking around, talking to people, knocking on doors, meeting people. And I will continue that if I'm elected after the election and all the way through my term. One of my favorite things of local government is the ability of, as I mentioned earlier, of anybody just to uh, see you at the bagel store and say, hey, Ross, um, what's this that I hear about this new development going into my neighborhood or um, whatever the concern of the day is or just to give me positive or negative feedback. And I'm committed to that level of of responsiveness. I'm committed to responding to emails and phone calls. I did that on the Poudre School District Board of Education, responded to every email and phone call, and uh, look forward to being able to do the same thing if I'm elected to City Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Campana, who's running for District 3. Thank you. Thank you again for putting this on. For those of you who are still watching tonight at nearly 9 o'clock, thank you for giving us your, your night. I think um, policy setting at the City Council level is uh, critical. And as I'm out walking neighborhoods and knocking on doors, I am shocked by the number of people that don't even know we have a race going on right now. I encourage you to talk to your friends. Tell people that there's a race going on. Tell them to watch this when it's been, going to be repeated. Tell them what you heard tonight. A minute and a half is not very long to give you an answer to get to know us. I have a website, Geno for Council. Please go to it. And if you want to uh, find out more information about me, you can find it there. Call me. I'll come meet you and grab coffee. We have a parade in the St. Patrick's Day Parade this weekend. We're giving people a lot of opportunities to get to know me um, more. And uh, I hope that through discussion and dialogue tonight, you'll see that I have invested uh, a lot of time and uh, effort into trying to be a good policy setter for our community. And um, I would uh, really appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campana. Now to Ms. Blake, who is also running for District 3. First of all, I'd like to thank the League for uh, allowing us this opportunity. And I would like to thank the community for embracing me uh, in the way that they have in various sectors of the community. This has been a great opportunity. I've enjoyed talking and meeting my neighbors as I go out and walk and talk and not doors. Um, and I just would appreciate the opportunity to serve you. That's my purpose. Um, I agree that there are many competent people sitting up here and all have great ideas. So for the community, to the community, I just say thank you for this opportunity. And if you want to learn more about me, you can visit my website. It's lindablake.com, and that's Linda with a Y. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to the candidates for running for District 1 and start with Mr. Stockover. Well, thank you all very much for coming. You've heard a lot about what I've done. I'd like to just share a little bit with you about who I am. I'm not really comfortable talking about myself. I'm not a shout from the rooftops type person. I'm more, I fly under the radar. I like to be known as a quiet doer. I bring a lot of different perspectives to the table. I'm fifth generation Colorado. I missed being a Fort Collins native by one day. I was born in Greeley and then my parents came here. I've owned a business. I've signed the front of a check. I take great pride in earning the right to sign the back of a check. I always bring passion. I always come prepared. I care deeply about Fort Collins, as we all do. I will be a good, strong voice for the citizens of Fort Collins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. This is a very exciting race. I mean, we've got four people in the race for District 1. Could you imagine if we had four people in every election? How great would that be? I mean, we've got a, a, a guy, business, environment, school, and then me. <laughs> I'm an average guy uh, wanting to do something for the city. I think, I think it's an advantage. I think uh, looking into the machine, you can fix it instead of being in the machine. I think that uh, the fact that I don't have any experience in the political arena is, will help me make a better decision for everybody in Fort Collins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overbeck. Again, I'm Bob Overbeck. I'm running for City Council District 1. I want to keep Fort Collins a great place to live, work, play, retire, raise a family, ride a bike, walk your trails, spend some time in your beautiful open spaces. But more importantly, I've been going out into this community. I've knocked on almost 1,000 doors in District 1. I've been up around Terry Lake, I've been up around the Maple Hill area, the Lind area, and I've been carrying this notebook where I write down your questions and I follow up with you to let you know I'm listening and I want to take your ideas, your thoughts, and what's important to you here in local government. I've heard what you had to say, it's important, and I want to represent the neighborhoods here in Fort Collins, this community, and District 1. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson? In conclusion. Let's remember that this is a nonpartisan election. When we recruited 917 people to surround Beatty School for an aerial picture, we didn't ask them if they were Republican, Democrat, Independent. We only asked them to help save their school and thereby to save their community. This community building thing is something that I do. And I ask you to vote for me to help create a better community and a better future for Fort Collins. Thank you. I'd like to thank each candidate for joining us tonight and sharing their vision for how they would like to serve the city of Fort Collins. We at the League believe that voting is an honor, a privilege, and a responsibility. We urge you all to vote. Thank you for watching this forum and good night.